Um, somebody played to me on the phone yesterday a short extract of myself on a video on Peter's uh, database of videos talking about participatory photography in about 2006. I sounded a lot younger and, uh, and I thought um, this is really strange because I'm about to do this lecture today which has got participatory <laughs> photography in the, in the title. The work that we were talking about in 2006 and which is on that video uh, actually started in 2001 which is where this picture comes from and it almost feels like time stands still. Either I've been highly unproductive and I've stayed that way for the last um, 16 or 17 years, which is a possibility, or um, things go around, come around, weave in and out, and I think that's more like it. This is a strand of work that I've been working on for all, all those years, those 17, 18 years, uh, with great pleasure, almost as much pleasure as I've got in being here today and presenting this to you. Um, and it's involved lots of different people. Mel, certainly one of them uh, here. It's lovely to see you, Mel. Um, I'll talk about Ian Kaplan. I'll talk about Susie Miles, who've been a big part of it as well. Um, what I want to do is to ask you, first of all, to think about that picture there, what that might mean to you. It's taken in a school in the north of England, just somewhere north of here. Uh, it was taken by a pupil and it shows one of the little buildings or outhouses or edges of the site. Have a think about what that might mean. What might that mean to a pupil and what might that mean to a teacher? I'm going to show you what it means or meant to one teacher who we asked to talk about that photograph taken by a pupil. This is what she said about it. So, the teacher's idea was that this was a place that was safe in a very specific sense, safe away from the teachers, and a place that she didn't find at all attractive. As you might imagine, pupils talking about the same building, and the same out space in the, on the edge of the site, had something very different to say about it. So keep that in mind. This is what um, two, year girl, two year 10 girls talking about this had to say. What is absolutely clear is that the uh, two perspectives that they held about this particular space in the school were poles apart, shall we say. And what also seems to me, looking at it now, is the, is the warmth and the generosity and the sense of fun that is communicated by the girls there talking about that space, talking about what it means to them in a very warm and affectionate sense, as opposed to what we saw just now, which was rather, rather negative, shall we say, rather constrained and constraining, and certainly not admitting of any of the social, um, the social side of school that we know is so important. <coughs> Thank goodness it made me feel that those girls know what's valuable in their school and they know that when they find a space like that where you can hang about and have fun and people meet up and have a good chat, thank goodness they recognise it and they understand it and that the teachers haven't taught them uh, all they know about what there is in this school. Here we also see a sense of transgression, a sense of pupils um, able to manage the business of boundaries and think about what's in, what's not, also what's allowed and what's not, and when they're going to cross those boundaries and how far. Um, and a really mature sense of, of how to manage those constraints that they are placed under. Really, really different perspectives coming from very, very different places. And basically that is this lecture in a nutshell. It's basically saying, how do we think about the very, very different spaces and places that people occupy, although they are actually in the same institution or the same, um, the same country, the same zone? So we're looking at multiple perspectives. This happens to be Holy Week, which is a very important week in the Christian calendar. And you might remember Pontius Pilate had a very important question to ask uh, on some day this week which was, what is truth? 
So if you think about multiple perspectives and then you think about what is truth, then you have some sense of maybe some contradiction to be thinking about. So truth is about knowing and knowing is about the knower and we are all knowers, we all know things, but we know different things by virtue of who we are and all the assumptions and cultural inheritance that we bring. You're welcome. <clears throat> and knowing those things and knowing those things differently, we act differently. But often we don't know ourselves why we do what we do. Um, and we aren't even always sure who we are either, I suspect. So we ourselves have multiple perspectives, depending on where we're coming from on a particular time. We are not the completely coherent people that we might like to present ourselves as, as I'm doing in some sense at the moment. And that has been very important to me as a researcher and it's why I've, I've often been drawn to ideas about discourse analysis, about thinking about the ways that we do things with words, we constitute things with words, we make things with words, and the way that words do things to us and operate on us and take us along in, in different directions. And they are very, very powerful and a lot of people have put a lot of study into that. What I'd like to focus on today is what images do in the same sort of a way. What can images do in the same sort of a way? How can we see the value of images as a way of <coughs> holding up and slowing down and thinking a bit harder about the, the way we know things, the way we see things, and how we might see things that are actually quite different to the way that other people see things, and vice versa. Okay, so coming back to that picture, um, it clearly gets very complicated. Should children have the opportunity to smoke in a school? Is the teacher right to see uh, that as a potentially dangerous place, although she calls it safe, um, for young people and their health outcomes from school? Um, would eradicating the freedom to smoke, if it was possible, remove other freedoms that we actually want children to have? Are we therefore in a, always in a place of tension about what to do? The, the value of having fun and relaxing and building friendships and associating and working out how to live together and making choices all seem to be so important that if we were to take that away in the name of some other uh, harm that we might be protecting children from, well, we have to be really sure what we're doing. I want to pause for a moment and, and acknowledge some people who have been part of this in a bit, bit more of a fuller sense. So, um, Ian Kaplan, many of you will not have met, but worked here um, as a research associate and um, researcher, doing his master's degree back in 2001. And I worked with him at that point, and, and this photograph that I've been showing, this one, comes from a project that we called the Apple Tree Project. We had about um, 70 pictures that we'd taken in that particular school, and we hadn't taken them, the young people had taken them, and they, uh, they'd taken the pictures, and then we'd ask pupils to comment on why they'd taken those pictures, and then we asked staff, without seeing those comments from pupils, on, to think about why they thought pupils had taken those pictures, or what they saw in those pictures, and we put those all together on a website, which sadly isn't any longer in operation, though I do still have it and I could put it back up somewhere if I uh, had the moment. It's fascinating exploring these different ideas that pupils have about this space that they all are in and the teachers likewise. Ian is passionate as a photographer and, and a very um, committed researcher and I'll be talking a bit more about some of his work later. And he brought this idea of of working more effectively with photography as part of our research to myself and other people in the University of Manchester, namely Susie Miles and some others as well. Um, and so with Susie and Ian, I was part of a, an inquiry-based learning project that we did with a centre called Siebel at one point. Um, it's also informed a lot of work in ENET, which is the Enabling Education Network, which is still running, although not any longer housed here. Mel was a big part of setting that up. Um, and participatory photography and, and other aspects have been something that we have continued to work on, as I say, in a kind of slow but steady way. A couple of years ago, Susie and I managed to pull things together to publish this edited 
book which has got lots of chapters with lots of photos, um, all in black and white, happily, from various PhD students and master students and others who uh, we'd worked with or other people had worked with over, over that sort of period of time. And I'm going to be using a couple of those chapters in a bit. The other person I'd like to credit as being a source of really helpful ideas and thoughts and crystallising things really well um, in this lecture is Maggie McClure, who works, I believe, still at MMU. Um, and her book, this book on discourse in educational research, I find absolutely fascinating. It's, it's very well thumbed and it's, got, you know, it's going yellow on the edges because it's one of those that I just keep coming back to as a, as a really useful source of thinking about how we are implicated in discourse, how we are doing things. Okay, so... What photographs do not do and it's very tempting to think, and we think of a photograph in, in many ways as a realistic impression of something, but it's really clear and very quickly clear that we can't think of photographs as making anything transparent. They don't. They are not in that business. They are deceptive in that way, many people would say. Um, they might appear to show something, but the framing that they inevitably carry with them um, the choices that are made about what to take a photograph and what to show as a photograph and so on means that they are anything but uh, obvious and communicative of what is actually there in any sense. But they are incredibly useful, I think, for researching multiple perspectives. They're really helpful for thinking about different people's perspectives. They're really helpful for thinking about how, diff how one person can change their perspective over, over a period of time and develop their thinking. And they're very helpful for, not just for individuals, but also for communities and, and trying to establish some sense of what, uh, how a community feels about something. I think they have incredible power in those senses. So Maggie McClure is not talking about photographs when she says this, but I, I'm applying her thinking I think photographs do these kinds of things. They deconstruct, they defamiliarize, they surprise, entangle, baffle, disconcert, interfere and trouble the way we think. And I'm going to try to show some of that uh, in the course of this lecture. And that's really good if they do those things because that's exactly what we need in the context of multiple perspectives. We need to have our own assumptions undercut and questioned. Um, McClure talks about being drawn into the weave of the discourse that we're all part of, actually being able to see what's going on a little bit more, um, rather than just be swept along by it, to slow down, to think twice, and to notice the, the particular and the, and the strange and the, and the interesting, rather than just assuming that we have a good story about what's happening in a classroom, in a school, in a, in a community and sticking with that story and seeing everything through the lens of that story. So seeing education afresh in some sense, undercutting our ingrained ways of seeing the classroom, seeing ourselves. So what I'm going to do now is to, is to show some of the ways that I've tried to do that in different contexts, three or four different contexts, um, some with teachers uh, and some looking at other people's work, doing similar things, but with uh, teacher educators, and then there's one other different um, context again that I'll talk about. But we're going to start with some teachers. So, this, this is very fresh. This is last week, and this is uh, with permission from my own trainee teachers who are pictured in these. The photographs themselves taken in a school local to here when <coughs> I took my group of 20 trainee teachers um, all together for a... Uh, uh, and at an initial point in their PGCE course, their teacher training course, and, asked, and we arranged for them to be teaching um, a, a lesson together uh, in groups of three or four, and then unpacking what had happened in that lesson uh, and how it had gone and what they'd learnt from it. So I took pictures at that point, got permission to use these pictures in this sort of a way, not to publish them, but to show in this sort of context, um, and to... Um, to then, um, in the way that I wanted to use them, come back to them just last week with the trainees. So I gave them the picture, 
printed out on a piece of A4, which is what you see there, and said, what I'd like you to do now is to talk about, or write about rather, how you've changed since that photograph was taken. How do you think you've changed since that photograph was taken? As a teacher, how have you changed? And I'm going to show you five of them, I think, and we'll talk very briefly about them. So, um, in this first one, we see um, the trainee talking about her confidence, how much more confident she feels, how much more she's able to structure her lessons according to the interests of the class, how she's able to communicate much better. She knows how to talk, she knows how to, uh, how to work with people, she knows she thinks, she knows what they like, and she knows uh, what's might, what might engage them. She also interestingly says she's come to realise that there's no set rule book to be a teacher and that everybody's different. That's how she's changed. Suggesting that at the start of the course she had quite a fixed idea of what it might mean to be a teacher and that we were going to tell her, presumably, or help her to understand what that was. And now she's understood actually there isn't. Which is quite interesting. What I've found is that this kind of approach produces something quite rich. This is only done in the context of 10 minutes silent, <coughs> silent thinking in the, in the middle of a lesson. It's not, it's not an extended piece of work. Uh, I'll go, go on and show you a more extended version of this in a minute. But um, I think these are, these are really valuable. This, this trainee again here, talking about um, better questioning, more open discussions, better professional responses to students off-topic questions the kind of personal questions that you might be asked as a, as a young teacher and not <laughs> always know what to deal with and it's really interesting that she sees she's now got capacity in that area. What I was also drawn to here was not taking it too seriously and I thought thank goodness for that. What a wonderful thing that a trainee is able to say in the context of all of that not taking it too seriously is something I've learned and something that's, that I've changed in, in regard to. Another trainee more confident, less self-doubt, better behaviour management and interestingly here, not worrying about stepping on mentors or teachers' shoes in relation to behaviour management. So really starting to establish his own sense of himself as a valid participant in the classroom alongside other professionals, really, really Im impressive. He also manages to communicate something to me in the fourth third bullet point there, better at planning and organising, learning from example. I need concrete examples of good planning, organising, practice to improve. I don't learn from theory very well, that was generous I thought. Um, I need practical examples. And he's learning how to collaborate better and I thought well if he's learning about not, not stepping on other people's shoes, not worrying about stepping on other people's shoes, then I think yes, you are learning how to collaborate better. So again, a really interesting set of hooks there to start to think about what it might mean for a, for a trainee teacher to develop as a teacher. Two more, and then we'll move on. Um, Andrew, oh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. This person here, uh, now feeling comfortable about being the centre of attention. Uh, but this point here, I am closer to feeling like an actual teacher. I am closer to feeling like an actual teacher. Again, this image of what it is to be a teacher is kind of there. And the, um, the image is in the mind. What is it to be an actual teacher? And how he can see that he's somehow moving closer towards it. And then there's this final one which I'm going to show you in a moment. I've now seen the gravity of the vortex that I have been sucked into. I feel now there is no escape. This fate, it seems, was written in the stars. <laughs> my first thought was to set that aside. And my second thought was, that's exactly what this lecture's about. It's about the moments where you see something completely differently because somebody manages to convey something completely against your assumptions. Now I know that this trainee is not entirely comfortable in his position in the course and his progress and so on, but I had no sense that he would be able to communicate or he would communicate something like that in this 
and he nearly set it aside as well and kind of hid it away and almost didn't want to give it to me and then said okay you can have this if you want it uh, and then I read it and thought wow okay so I've got a lot to talk about now to this training um, so the vortex I think the vortex is one moment of bafflement and um, undercutting of the of the thinking that I was talking about earlier for me as a teacher trainer helps me to see things slightly differently helps me to understand that I do not know all that there is going on for the people that I'm working with however well I think I know what do you mean by no escape exactly exactly that's the point what does he mean by no escape um, does he mean that uh, he can see now what being a teacher is actually about and since he's now committed to it that's now too late to do anything about but he's going to carry on on the course he's set or is he speaking much more metaphorically about the about the somehow horror of being in the classroom with pupils that it feels like he is just sucked down and down into something very dark uh, I don't know Yes, but I'm resistant to, to putting my usual optimistic version of, uh, of what this might mean onto his words and rather think it's important to stay with them for a bit and hold on to them and think about it for a bit and wonder and wonder how many other people might say similar things if they were in a particular moment. I'm going to talk now about a, a slightly more extended version of this which um, I did a few years ago and which became a chapter in this book that I talked about. Um, I'm going to read a little bit from, um, from the words that uh, Kaylee, as I call her in here, uh, used. So with Kaylee I did a very similar thing and she took the photographs from a short video um, that I made of her in the classroom, again with various permissions all in place. Um, <coughs> and then took out stills from the video and printed them and gave them to her to choose from. I gave her about eight different stills and said which of these are important to you in thinking back to how you were. Again with a, with a gap of about five, six months between this point when, she, when the photographs were taken and the point where I interviewed her. <clears throat> and so I'd like to think a bit more about what that means because she certainly got very very engaged the whole chapter is about her and her thinking it's called becoming a science teacher in England images metaphors and justice it's about the unpacking of her position that's possible because she embraced that opportunity to talk really readily and um, I think she was in some sense um, made more confident that I was serious about it because I'd gone to the trouble of producing these photographs and producing them for her and putting them in front of her and asking her to talk about herself not in a general sense but in a very specific sense in a kind of demonstrating a, a certain caring as a researcher and as her tutor at the same time in the context of teacher training I think they positioned me as a careful listener the first picture that she picked out to talk about was this one and she said this is about the essence of what it is to be a teacher for me um, she said I suppose the whole of teaching for me is about where do you start and this was one of those experiences for me because I didn't know those kids at all what we were trying to do was establish what they knew and what they didn't know and it's always fascinating because I'm, and I'm always surprising I think not just on this day but uh, in teaching and that's the way I like to start off because even if you don't know the, even if you know the class you don't really know what they know and so she's she's understanding something for her about the essence of teaching being that you start where the young people are rather than where you think you might want to um, the essence of teaching, where do you start? So there's one point coming out of the discussion that we had. 
The second picture that she picked up on was this one. And here she started to talk much more about the attention that she paid to individual pupils. She said, I thought that's the kind of teacher I'm going to be. I'm going to stand there. She was referring to that one at this moment. That's the kind of teacher I'm going to be. I'm going to stand there and they're going to listen. And that was the way to teach kids, really. But I get so much more out of that. And I say, in this one, you, you seem to be leaning heavily on this hand. I'm looking at her hand here and the way she's bearing down on it. Um, you seem to be really giving them a space to speak. It looks like you're leaning towards them to say, come on. And she <coughs> says, you get so much more out of them when they're solving a puzzle or in the moment getting it. It's just fantastic. Whereas there, you can only do so much of that. It doesn't work for that long. She had a very strong sense of what that was about. But she also went on to say something more. She said something about her commitment um, and about why she was doing this, why she was wanting to pay attention to these young people. <coughs> you can pull the quiet ones in, whereas when you're talking to 30, it's very difficult to get everyone involved and I asked her why is that important she said I think it's just imperative I just want kids to be taught how I want my kids to be taught and I feel if they're not at if they're not all learning if they're not all understanding I've not done my job and I say so in a way you test yourself by saying well if any one of them there is like somebody's son somebody's daughter and she says I always think that because I know what I expect of teachers and I have high expectations she's a parent so People ought to have them of me, haven't they? <coughs> and we suddenly get this huge, strong sense of Kaylee as developing her practice in the light of this really strong commitment to young people as if she were their parent, a proper version of in, in loco parentis. And then one more slide about Kaylee. Because it wasn't all sweetness and light by the time she'd got to this point in her journey. Back here, everything was possible. Um, here, things had, had moved on, and she was coming up against some of the challenges of fitting in professionally into um, a, an institution. And she talks about the challenge, for example, of um, what assessment for learning is meant to be in the school that she's currently teaching in. She said, they might smile and put up a green card. Green cards are um, a way of trying to test out whether pupils are confident or not with their learning. Put up a green card or a red card according to how confident you are. They might smile and put up a green card, but it means bugger all, doesn't it? Anyone can put up three fingers, two fingers, one finger, whatever. But until you see them doing, until you see them doing, then you don't really know what they're at, do you? The kids aren't stupid. They look at who is next to them. Even if you say, put your heads down, close your eyes, all that nonsense. And I just find it nonsense, quite honestly. And I don't think it's illustrative of where people are at. And it really frustrates me because my feedback constantly is my AFL isn't good enough. And I think that's my best. Just because I don't do the obvious. But I do get around the room. I do think I make sure. To me, they're a AFL, this, and the last one their AFL, their assessment for learning. And what I do, after I've gone round the room, I pick up misconceptions or strong points, what I think was worth illustrating. But I wouldn't feed all that back because that's boring. But I feed back the strong points, what was concerning me, and then I'd work out where I was going next from that. But I often don't think that's seen as AFL, which I think is ridiculous because that's how you can find out so much. There's one final point about Kaylee's journey that she comes to and I put it at the end of the chapter oh it, were, it was her last words in the interview according to what I've written here the last words return to the cost of her committing to this 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 and this and then to committing to finding her, her own place in the context of an institution as a teacher she says 
It's just that actually it's felt like torture. It's just been so utterly hard. And I just think it's just obviously been some resilience in me that's kept me going because it's been ridiculously tough. But then you just get moments when you're just like, this is brilliant. But it's just that there's been so much to learn, it's just dot, dot, dot. I knew that, I knew already when I did that interview that Kaylee was a very serious minded person and that she was very committed to what she was doing. But I could not have known how committed she was and why she was so committed. I could not have known how it felt from her perspective and I certainly would have erased, if I'd even dared to think about it, the pain that she expresses at the end there. Because I think that's what she's talking about. And so I think photographs, stimulating thinking, reflection and rich reflection can get to a point where we can start to see something very much more about the place that are um, the people that we think we know, whether they be teacher trainers, teacher trainees in the context of a teacher training relationship, or pupils in the context of a school, or, or, or where we think we know, we, we know them, we actually find out much more um, and know that we, we can't just rely on our assumptions. So, anybody know what that is? It's a painting. It was painted in the early 17th century by a Flemish painter called Cornelis Gis Gisbrechts. He did a lot of work in Belgium and Holland and France at the time. And his speci speciality was drawing very real to life, very true to life paintings. Incredibly true to life. Well, I, I love this painting. My attention was drawn to it by Maggie McClure. She mentions it in this book. And the idea of this painting is to befuddle us a little bit. Because what is it a painting of? It's clearly not a painting of a painting. It's actually the painting of the back of a painting. It's the back of a painting. So the painting hasn't got a painting in it and yet it's a painting. So it's at once a painting and not a painting. And if it's a painting and not a painting, then who are we looking at this painting? Because we're not the viewers of a painting, but then who are we if we're not looking at a painting? Because we're looking at the back of a painting. Um, <laughs> I like the way that the painting, this painting by Cornelis Gibrecht, mocks our sense of reality, undercuts our assumptions about what we think we know and what we think we see. It's not an optical illusion, it's a very deliberate attempt to place in front of us something which is both and, both a painting and not a painting. Um, and in the context of all those other paintings that were being done at the time, this one stands there and says, what's this all about? What's it all about? What what, what assumptions do you have about paintings? What assumptions do you have about yourself and your entitlement to look at paintings? Who are you to look at a painting? Why should the paintings be about things that you want to look at? Etc, etc. You can just imagine this guy and his delight at the thought of making this painting. Like, why shouldn't I paint the back of a painting and see what they do with that? Which has now become one of his most famous paintings. Well, what do you do with that? What I'd like to try to do is to, is to take us a little bit further about how we might find a language to capture some of this idea about um, this befuddling, this, this undercutting that photographs can do and that I think this, paint, this particular painting does. Some photographs do it more than others. They undercut and they may make us see things differently. Um, and some and some probably don't. Some kind of family snaps or some pictures of classrooms might do nothing like that. But some certainly do. They certainly do have this effect of making us think twice. Um, and where myself and Susie have gone with this lately is in relation to something that I included in my own PhD, which I did right back in 2001. I have been around this 
institution rather a long time. Um, and uh, it was the work of a, an anthropologist and a literary, literary anthropologist called um, uh, Mary Louise Pratt that I'm going to talk about and which we've, Susie and myself, have started to refer back to and think about. I think these ideas of Mary Louise Pratt are really, really valuable. She talks about the idea of the contact zone. Now, she's studied a lot of, um, uh, of historical examples, but particularly focused on South America in the, in the colonial period. And she says, and I think it's a way of holding up our thinking a bit, that it would be very helpful if we could stop talking about things like the colonial period and start talking about something like a contact zone. If we stop talking about colonial, the colonial period, then we'll start to think harder about what that sort of period means and what it might have meant. She says, a contact perspective emphasises how subjects get constituted in and by their relations to each other. It's about co-presence, interaction, interlocking understandings and practices, often within radically asymmetrical relations, relationships of power. I'm wondering whether we can talk about current examples of what the sorts of things that we've been starting to look at and make sense of them using some of this language and some of this way of thinking. And I'm going to try to persuade you that we might. There might, there might be some value to this. At least I think there might be. So this is one of the examples that Mary Louise Pratt focuses on. And she basically says about this particular example that this is a product of the contact zone. This is a product of the contact zone. What this actually is, is just two pages out of 1,189 pages of a text produced by one of the colonised in South America. Is anybody familiar with this? It's beautiful. It's all online. It's been placed online in a project that was done fairly recently by the Danish Royal Library. This manuscript has been in the Danish Royal Library since about the 1660s. <coughs> the manuscript itself was produced around about 1615, I think, by Guaman Poma. And it's called The First New Chronicle and Good Government. And it's written around about 1615 and addressed to King Philip III of Spain. And it outlines in great detail and beautifully illustrated and beautifully combining words, mostly in Spanish but some in Quechua. Um, it outlines the injustices of the colonial rule and it argues that the Spanish were foreign settlers in Peru. This is our country, he said, because God has given it to us. This is our country because God has given it to us. He's writing to the king. He acknowledges the king as a very important power and in fact a, a, a king with uh, the divine right and so on. Surprisingly enough, the king never received this document. I imagine all the people in the middle who thought this is not the document we're going to give to King Philip III of Spain. And so it ends up in the Danish Royal Library in the 1660s, not, never having actually got to its particular target and being lost for about 250 years, um, 300 years, being rediscovered um, in the early 20th century uh, and then being the subject of a lot of, of rethinking. Now one of those people rethinking it is Mary Louise Pratt. But before we come back to her, these two pages. On the left you see um, an illustration of Don Francisco Pizarro, one of the colonising powers, setting fire to the house of Guaman Poma's grandfather. There's the grandfather and the rest of the family inside. There's the flame outside. There's the level of terror being um, visited on the, on the population. Uh, and the words in Spanish, I think in Spanish, yeah, it would be in Spanish, say, uh, hand over your gold and silver. And the, 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 the whole text is like this. It's, it's full of 
absolutely hard-hitting, satirical if you like, powerful evocations of what it's like to be living in that time. There's a whole other chapter which does something really simple. It just draws a series of pictures, probably 30, of the key buildings in 30 different towns in Peru before the Spanish came. There was this, there was this, there was this, there was this, there was this. You look through them all and think, wow, this is, this is really hitting home the message. Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? What's going on? This one is a picture of um, the city of Cuzco, the royal, the royal court of 12 Inca kings. Look at the detail, look at the, look at the beauty of the architecture, look at the layout of the city, look at the, the pride in the picture itself. Um, so this is an incredible manuscript. And Mary Louise Pratt says, this is an artifact of the contact zone. This can help us to disturb our assumptions and rethink our thinking and change the way we, we understand things. And she takes this text and uses it to do that. So it does all those things. And there's the link. You can have this PowerPoint and you can follow the link and enjoy the text or search for it yourself and you'll find it fairly easily. Mary Louise Pratt says this, we're looking for the pedagogical arts of the contact zone. These will include, we're sure, exercises in storytelling and in identifying with the ideas, interests, histories and attitudes of others. Experiments in transculturation and collaborative work and the arts of critique and parody and comparison, including unseemly comparisons between elite and vernacular cultural forms. And she goes on. And I think that list is so interestingly powerful as a way of thinking about the photographs and, the, and the, the products of the contact zone that we might start to rethink our own assumptions by. Um, that, that's what Susie and I have started to try to do. <coughs> I have an eye on time, as I should have, so I'm going to start talking about one example. Um, so Ian Kaplan committed to research against injustice, took himself to the east of Burma and uh, great personal hardship and so on, got involved, very involved with a, a movement there um, in the name of the Karen people in the highlands, an area controlled by the Burmese army and forced to, uh, with, where people were being forced to teach and learn and think in Burmese, but they were Karen and they had their own language. And these teacher educators that he was working with, um, he was working with to try to document and think about what they were, what they were experiencing, uh, were doing extraordinary things. They were, they were mobile teacher educators and they were going from place to place in this area, in this Karen territory. And they were trying to work with the, with the Karen teachers to develop their skills and also to build their confidence. And, the way that he worked was by asking them to take pictures and then they together constructed a text to describe the picture. And I want to say that this becomes something like a product of the contact zone, this, this thing here that we're looking at. I think it's helpful to see it as a product of the contact zone. It sort of helps to give a language for talking about it. Because one of the things we notice here, for example, and it, and it was one of the things that um, Pratt was talking about, is that what becomes possible in this work is the upholding of the value and the revisiting of the value of re understanding our own history, our own history, and speaking our own language and telling our own stories. And it comes out really strongly. <clears throat> Here's another example. There's three examples. This is the second one. Um, from that same... Um, work by Ian and his colleagues in a Karen place. We walked for 10 days to reach our training site, but crossing the car road was the most dangerous part of the journey. We hid beside the road until we were sure the Burmese army weren't looking. We were lucky, but we heard another group of Karen were, were attacked crossing the same road the same day. Without the words and without any understanding of what that is, what you see is a road and what you think of is travelling down a rather dangerous road because it's quite bumpy and difficult to go along. Uh, what, what you see when you understand how this has been constructed is something completely different. Suddenly the road becomes a barrier. 
a barrier to movement and a very dangerous thing to move across. The danger isn't going that way, the danger is going that way. So we see our own assumptions about, the, about what this might be completely undercut straight away. I don't think this, what I'm talking about is not really trying to see things from other people's perspectives so much as finding ways to undercut our own assumptions. Undercut our own assumptions. Because that's the difficult bit. Undercut our own reference. Undercut our own thinking. It's not so much trying, trying to be somebody else. It's trying to say, gosh, why did I think like that? And how can I think differently? There's a third example. Again, it refers to something which Pratt was talking about. <clears throat> On the surface, this is a picture of the same teacher educators celebrating the Buddhist water festival with some villagers. But the Burmese army don't want the Karen teachers meeting with outside organisations and it's really dangerous for them to travel around. So we organised the summer vacation training to coincide with the water festival. And the teachers pretended that they were villagers travelling to attend the festival. And Pratt suggests that out of the contact zone you'll always get subterfuge, trickery, ambivalence, irony, unseemly comparisons between the elite and vernacular cultural forms. Here's a vernacular cultural form, if you like. And how does that fit in the world of teacher education and learning to teach and so on. <clears throat> so again, it deconstructs our position and, and challenges our investments and our assumptions and our frameworks when we realise we haven't got a clue what this life is like because we see things completely differently. So that's a chapter in this book and I'm going to take um, one more example from the book for another uh, example. Very different in context, but equally powerful in, in some senses. And for this section, sadly, I've got no photographs to show you. Um, one of the beauties of doing a lecture about photography is that you can put in lots of images and it just, just feels much better, doesn't it? Um, I think that's why Mel has been invited to do so many keynotes around the world, because he's always got great pictures to show people. <laughs> this, this story is about honour and shame. So, <clears throat> the context is a story in another book, a book written by Zana Moussen and uh, a British journalist. Now, she's a British Muslim woman. She was brought up in England and she was sold into a forced marriage at the age of 15 by her father for £1,300. This is about, happened in the 1980s. The book was published in the 90s. Uh, uh, Mansour took photographs from Zana's book to explore ideas of honour and shame with British Muslim health and social workers of South Asian heritage. You imagine, um, you imagine her in a, in a room somewhere in Hume, uh, not very far away, and with a group of about seven or eight um, health and social workers and sitting down and, and, and playing with them is what I want to say. What she did was took the photographs from that book, which I haven't got with me, and took the labels off them and then gave them the photographs and said, make a story out of this. What do you think is going on? And they made a story out of this. And they said, oh, it's probably a marriage is happening and da-da-da-da-da. And then she, uh, at a certain point in the proceeding, she, she disturbed all that. She said, well, actually, here's the la she took the labels, she took the covers off and allowed the labels to be seen and then the story became clear and she told them that story. <clears throat> At the end of the focus group, I thanked the participants and declared the activity finished. Neelam got up from the floor and very quietly and slowly announced, so now I will make my way out, and deliberately stamped on the father's face in photograph number nine as she went. Jabin followed by placing her shoe on the same photograph while remaining seated on the floor. Cheers, laughter and applause erupted. Jabin said, stab it! And Rana suggested the photograph could be made into a dartboard. Tariq silently took photograph nine and drew a hangman's noose around the head of the father. And um, Nasreen herself, Mansour, Nasreen Mansour took 
her own opportunity at that point. I maintained a neutral stance up to the point where Neelan stamped on photograph nine. But at that point, she joined in the jubilation. I think it's really helpful to see this group of people as constructing something of a text in something of a contact zone, a bit, a bit of a virtual contact zone. The British Muslim father from the 1994 book was clearly not there, but he was kind of virtually there in some sense. And what Nasreen was doing was constructing a text together with them in a very playful way, full of opportunities for misreading, with at least three levels of storytelling going on. The original text, then Mansour's playful representation repre of that text, and then the restoring of the participants, and then the collision of those three things. And I think she was doing something of a construction job, and I think they were all doing it together, and they, and they ended up by making something which had a textual quality to it, and which was certainly illustrative and productive of something really positive. Because what came out of this... <clears throat> I've summarised here. These stories interacted and provided space for the expression of the dislocation felt by those participants arising from their own post-colonial experience. In that space which they created, having gone through that emotional story together, it was possible for them to start to express the beauty of honour as a concept together with a revulsion at the patriarchy which it can be situated in. A celebration of the ideal of purity in family life together with an awareness of the possible emergence of control as a response to that shame. And making it personal, even within their own families. And you can feel that in the chapter. You can feel the, the, the value of this engagement that they went through and the, and the place that they created as a result of engaging in what I think of as something of a contact zone. Suspending assumptions, allowing uh, things to be said, allowing good communication about ideas rather than stereotypes, even about themselves in that case. <clears throat> so I see both Ian and Nasreen as deploying some of the pedagogical arts of the contact zone, as finding ways to build some communication in that space. So my final example, I think I've hardly got any time left, um, comes from something that Samar, where are you, and myself are working on. Samar is a PhD student. We're, we're working together on um, an example from school. I think school, we are, I would argue, has some of the features of a contact zone. Unequal power relations, different cultures coexisting, young and old, white and BME, middle and working class, I think it's helpful to see school in some senses as a contact zone. And then to understand through that lens why communication can be so difficult, how we might um, resist or how we might notice, first of all, all our assumptions and then how we might undercut and start to resist them. And I think if we do that, we make sense of the whole idea of pupil voice because People voice is not just a nice thing to do to understand the kids a little bit better. It's essential if we're going to understand more of the reality of the institution that we're in. Because it's not just about us. And what we assume might well not be true. So Samar's work is about science education and it's about thinking hard about what pupils think when they come to a science lesson. Um, and I'll go through the example quickly because we are running out of time, but here's where it started. This wasn't in Samar's work, this is previous work with another teacher. She asked pupils to go away and take a picture of something that they thought was to do with science, but in their own home. And they took a picture and they came, or this particular one took a picture and came back with this. And then this teacher asked them to write about why they'd taken that picture. And I'll just read it to you, through with you. So this picture is a picture of some grass. It's in my garden. I think this picture is science, as it's very amazing. What I mean is that inside the grass lives ants and other insects, and lots of scientists study them. And if insects and plants are living things, have science in them, then so do we. I took this picture as it is science, and it shows how insects live in it. 
Grass is kind of relevant to me as it is beautiful and makes me wonder at the great things within it. Wow. Wow. Who would have thought that science could mean something like that to that pupil? Science often does not mean that kind of thing to young people. It means something that they barely understand why they're learning and it's a whole set of procedures and loads and loads of facts that they have to get in their head somewhere when they go into a science classroom in a school. And it might also have something about Brian Cox somewhere or something, but actually there isn't a coherent picture of what science is um, that young people have. And that was Samar's starting point and now thinking about the, this project springing out of this. What do they think? Let's start with that. What do they think? So Samar did something similar, more systematic and more, more developed with a group of young people. And um, there's a picture that one of them came back with. For me, I think science like explained the world to me. For example, religion, science, completely different things. But even though like, I think some people religious, they don't believe in science, but I think go hand in hand. If you're a religious person, you're going to see the world in a scientific way and the logic behind everything in science. Amina, 14. Amina is grappling with the difference between religion and science. Nobody asked her to. Samar certainly didn't. She's come back with that because she's thinking about these things and she's finding a way to express her developing ideas about the relations between things that philosophers and others have spent millennia trying to understand the, the, the relation between, certainly the last 400 years. Um, and there we go. Who knew that Amina was thinking about that? Certainly not the science teacher. Another pupil, oh, Amina on the right hand side, let's just follow Amina for a second. It's science inspired, has inspired me because it's like something really small. We look to the sun, we look to the plants, but we don't really notice how the ground is really made of. So I think we know this stuff made of. I think that's really fascinating. That's why I want learning science and, that's, and, and how this is made. I wanted to do something, I don't know what it's called, it has something to do with geography and science, people who go on mountains. Ah! <laughs> She's talking about something she hasn't got the words for. Who knew that she might be interested in geology? She is, she doesn't know what the word is. Who knew that she was? Certainly not the science teacher. And Zara, surprisingly, year, uh, uh, 11, eight, 11 years old in a low set. In the real world, we have the floor to walk on. If we didn't, then I don't know. We need like the environment. That's why I chose this for the real world. This is her picture of the real world. Finishing this example with, um, with Zoya. Zoya's picture of something that inspires her to do science. Again, science teacher doesn't know this about Zoya. Because I like plants, and this is telling me that if I like the plants, science tells me I can search about the plants. This is something at home, like my mum really likes the plants. It's a real plant. She always takes care of them. So when I saw her makes me think why and how those plants were born and get older, it makes me really want to search about that. I've put this in as well because Samar asked her. She finds science lessons boring. Lessons are not exciting for her. And she doesn't want to be a science teacher. <laughs> um, and yet, when it comes to the science of plants, and when it comes to the connection with her mum, when it comes to understanding the care that her mum exercises towards plants, and how that makes her think about plants, where do plants come from? Where did they originate? How do they grow? How do they get older? then she's fascinated and she's very scientific or at least she could be so in a very simple way in a sense I think this has power to um, to help us even within subjects to start to see uh, see things differently and I know it links very strongly with Rebecca's work in terms of maths um, and, and sorry in Rebecca's work in terms of literacy and um, Laura's work in terms of maths um, starting to understand the perspective slightly differently. But I think it, it has huge application in all sorts of ways, this, this kind of way of working. Um, my working assumption is that 
Much of our research is done in a contact zone and teachers teach in a contact zone which makes sense of, to me of the power of photographs to undercut assumptions and disturb our position and the need for reflection by teachers who are working in that zone if they're going to understand their role or if we are going to understand our role which is where we started back here with this picture and we've looked more closely at the unsettling challenge of this picture and other pictures we've looked at Simon's vortex and then we've looked at issues very directly of power and assumptions and domination now my sense is that understanding that we work in a contact zone might provoke us towards might actually push us towards dialogue not because it would be nice to talk to the kids or because it would be nice to understand from a different perspective or out of some some kind of politeness or out of a school effectiveness tactic but out of respect out of the desire to communicate and out of the virtue that we can actually feel of having our own assumptions disturbed and unsettled so thank you very much for listening to them Anything about anything. <laughs> You're very welcome. Go and have a good review. <laughs> yeah, any questions? I, I have a quick question just about the, some, of the, some of the first photos you were showing about the students' work and how, you know, where does this, how have you changed and so on. Yeah. And just, I was starting, you, you put a few examples up and I was trying in my head to start analyse them and trying to figure out well, what role is the photograph actually playing in this? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Like, imagine if you just said, well, how have you changed since that day? Yeah, yeah, rather yeah, than yeah, yeah. The photo. yeah. And all I could see was that at times it seemed to start off by people talking about how confident they felt. It quite, felt quite like emotional things they were recalling. Hmm. When they saw themselves, they remembered their lack of confidence mm -hmm. maybe initially. So the early ones were about that and then it kind of maybe tailed off just into regular thinking back to that time. Yes. Um, but then the contrast is with the Kaylee one, in yeah. a sense, which is similar, but it's, she's seen herself in the flow. Isn't it? it doesn't feel like a particularly emotional thing. It's more like she can see herself in the flow of helping <coughs> students and so on. And that's not really a question, is it? But I've I been looking at these things a bit more. Have you seen any role I do see a difference they, between those two. And the, the one... But the what are the folk was actually doing? Mm. The, one is, the one is, a, is a, an immediate response with no, um, no other provocation from an interviewer, for example. So Kaylee is the product of an interview around those photographs. And so a very obvious and careful listener, as well as the photographs, provoking some memories and some thinking. Um, it's a really good question. What, does the, what do they actually, what are they actually doing? I think they are evoking some, some feeling. I think that's right. I think they do evoke some feeling. And then um, I think they're, they're allowing a sense that it's okay, okay to be concrete about things. It's okay to talk in concrete terms rather than in abstract terms. I think it helps to ground the discussion. Uh, as we see when Kaylee's talking about what I was feeling then and what that photograph's like compared to that one, how I thought I would teach like that compared to how I realise is the value of that. It's... Um, it, it, it draws things down to um, a level that is not abstract, and, but which is really helpfully reflective, I think. And I think the, the, the photographs without the interviews um, do some of that. And, and it's interesting just what's possible in that short space of time, I think, just in terms of what's, what's available there. I suppose it's about visibility rather than transparency. Mm. They make things more visible, but previously hidden. So we've got two perspectives on that building, for example, that neither of them would have considered the one, the yeah. perspective of the other. So, yeah. so I suppose that's also a contradiction. Yes. Is it? I think it <laughs> so is. No. I mean, the, the, the feeling of that in the, class, in the class where I gave out those photographs and said, look at it, was, oh, that's me. You know, there was a huge 
stir of me. That was me then, that was me. There was a huge kind of chat about, wow, look at you, look at you, there then, at that point, as opposed to us now in this classroom. And a lot of reflection that we try to do is, without that ground, is, tends to be quite abstract, I think. Tends to be, well, I used to be, you know, and now I'm... And I think you see the, p the possibility of much more grounded reflection in that. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you for your talk. And I'm interested in uh, um, a bit more of what you mean by using the term contact zone. And you say that in a way it's like replacing post-colonial the words. So I was, one, I was, I was not really sure uh, mm -hmm. what it actually means mm -hmm. and how uh, does power domination or maybe you know, the power dynamics or you know, the sort of inequality mm -hmm. is being played in the words of contact zone? Contact zone is, is an attempt, as I understand it, to think about the actual relationships that are taking place and the places that people are actually coming from in that, in that meeting between une people from unequal power positions. So um, the example, the post the colonial example is one where you have a whole um, civilization being contacted, <laughs> connected with in a, in the process of what we might call colonial, a colonial period, colonial time. Um, but then if we say, well, looking at it only through that lens doesn't allow us to see the actual position that people are occupying there, doesn't allow us to see um, how that 1,189 page text might have ever been produced, for example, because we wouldn't expect it, we wouldn't think we would ever see anything like that. Um, and yet it's there, so it completely it takes away some of the assumptions, I think, about what unequal power is like and allows us to start to see, okay, yes, but what's possible in that? What's actually happening there? What's actually going on? Um, and that's how I see, for example, in Ian Kaplan's work in Burma, because we often have portrayals of, um, of oppression um, where we might have lots of photographs of, of bombed out schools or burnt out schools or in a conflict zone like that. <clears throat> and yet that's not what we see in those photographs with that text from, from Ian. We don't see any of that. We see people describing what they are able to do, describing their agency, describing their power, describing their ability to subvert and and be cautious and be, and be tactical and be clever about managing to resist. We see all of that. Um, and that changes the way we think about the Karen people, I think. And, and the same is true in that photograph there, in some sense. That's what we see when we listen to those two year, year 10 girls talking about it, in some sense. Because we see the other side uh, on much more equal terms. I think there's a potential for explosion in all this conflict. And I remember years ago when neither of us had grey hair, uh, uh, Ian Kaplan came to help me with a school, working with a secondary school in deepest Lancashire. And he did a fantastic thing, he was brilliant at this kind of stuff. He had groups of 16 year olds and they went off in pairs around the school and they took photographs of places they felt safe and places where they didn't feel safe. And the kids have been nominated because of were all sorts of you know, different backgrounds and types and so on. And as they were, he got them to make collages of their photographs. And as they were doing that, he was actually interviewing them, mm -hmm. prompting them. And he recorded it on the video camera. It was fantastic just to watch him do it, really. And I remember going with him to a meeting of the senior staff, about 10 of them, on a long, miserable, cold, damp evening. And it was one of the lowest points in my, in my career, really. Because he presented this fantastic account of really challenging stuff that some of these kids had come up. The kids were very positive about school, by and large. But all we got was denial. You know, they tell you lies, the sample's too small, they have a hundred reasons as to why this wasn't. Yeah. Now there was a background to this, we didn't realise. The school was it just been announced for the clubs, and all these people were worrying about the jobs. But uh, it, it, often that story never comes back to me, because we're dabbling in people's lives in those contexts, as you call them, where we could 
actually blow things up and make things worse. So the question, which is not well, I, but I don't think the ownership of this kind of process is, is really with researchers. Sure. I, think it's, I think what I'm talking about is something that um, we, we would be well to adopt as teachers. I mean, I see myself as a teacher. So adopting it as a teacher is what I'm more interested in. Your example uh, of the teacher, I mean, it struck me that you were in the kind of process of coaching those teachers, but you were you're taking the photographs to them, training to teachers, mm -hmm. getting them to. What does it mean to you? What is it saying to you? It's a kind of it's inquiry based approach to teaching and learning. Yeah. But I'm also very interested in what that says about me as a teacher trainer. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking about my own assumptions, and that's what I felt so strong so strongly about the example with Kaylee, for example. It's like I'm understanding my own job here mm -hmm. in a way that really tests me out. Mm -hmm. Because I think I know what's going on for her and I think I know how to support her and so on, but actually do I? And I, and I think this, if the teacher in the school had the process that we're talking about as part of her toolkit, then she could develop her practice in a different way because she could use this kind of approach. And that's why, for example, John um, and others of us on the secondary course are so keen on the idea of pupil voice, I think, because we see it as a methodology for um, helping teachers to undercut their own assumptions. And I'm suggesting that Photographs are just a part of a way of helping to do that. But yeah, can I just add to what Mel said? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's absolutely right. And it just happens I spent this morning um, looking at the proposals for the uh, pupil voice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, what Mel said is absolutely spot on, I think. But what, what, what I saw, apart from one, yeah. apart from one, I looked around at a dozen, apart from one, um, they were all in denial. And the denial took different forms. The, the, the assignment involves trainees listening to what students have to say about a, a topic and then discussing it, analysing it and, and presenting it as an assignment. Mm -hmm. and the thing is, they have to listen first to what pupils say, yes, seven pupils, yes, eight pupils. And the form of the, the, the denial took, the main form, was overcomplicating it. Too much methodology, too much research, too much, um, too much of the experimental research. Mm, mm, mm. You know, too many graphs, too many preparation for graphs. <laughs> instead of the much simpler idea of just sitting down with a group of students and listening to actually listening to what mm, they have to say. Mm. And I know it's not that simple, and, and Andy has just complicated the, the that simple process for me um, in in the course of the, of the. Of, um, of his lecture, but it, simply, it still doesn't have to be overcomplicated. And you know how, how we get to that, how we you know create mm. a forum where what was that phrase you used earlier on? That forum where uh, pupils can indulge in subterfuge and irony. I mean, they will do that at school on the way home. But there's no sanctioned place for that to happen, is there? Yeah. So, yes, I've got a lot of ideas buzzing around. Sorry, that's not a question, Andy, but, <laughs> but you might want to comment. Well, I, d um, I don't think I've complicated the process. I think I've just been thinking about the, no, you the, the reason why it's a useful process or an important process. That's what I think I've been doing. I'm not suggesting that you should do it in a complicated way. I'm saying um, this is why it's potentially powerful, I think. This is, this is a, a, a kind of way of thinking about the, the problem, if you like, um, that th this solution of yours addresses. Yes, that's right. And I think when, when it does happen, when you get a trainee who does genuinely li listen to the pupils and reports that back, then I think that is very powerful. Right. I think it shows the danger why you need methodologies like this in terms of the students you're talking about. Do you imagine that teacher would just ask those kids what do you do at lunchtime? They wouldn't chat about it. No. Place, we do all these things and so on. So simply sitting down and asking people what, they, you know, yeah. what their voice is doesn't necessarily no, lead to it. And you have to find yeah. Yeah. ways around it, I guess. However, on that point, I say that some of this media is facilitating the response by getting them to take certain photographs, by focusing their ideas while look at what you're stood here doing, look at what you're stood there doing, you're almost drawing them to come out with those answers that you might actually be looking at. 
looking for. So the teacher who stood at the front of the room might reflect back and go, well, this is where I was at the beginning. And then you take another photograph of her talking to actually someone. <laughs> you're almost asking a photo, well, look at what's going on. You're driving her to that conclusion. I'd be a bit more interested in what's going on without showing them the photographs and saying, what sort of reflection are you doing without being facilitated for a response? OK. Although you still have Ex to find expand the project. Kind of objective core run. So you do have to find something, yeah. yeah. If it's not a photo, it'd have to be a, a, a word, perhaps, or a phrase or something. Mm. I'm going to try it. <laughs> <laughs> Just be careful of the ethical dimension. Sorry, that's yeah. right. I haven't talked about those, but there are. We, we've alluded to some, but there well, that's are. That's another part of the denial process. <laughs> yes. Yes, there is, a, there is absolutely that. The number of people that say there are no ethical <laughs> implications of my project. Well, let's try it. I'm done. Happy note. Thank you again, Andrew. Thank you very much. Thank you, all of you. Thanks.